It is my pleasure to welcome Draga Geld to the Slovenia Australian channel. Draga's contribution and involvement with the Slovenian Australia community, and particularly in Victoria, is enormous. Her most impressive CV's panorama scans across education, culture, authoring, and publishing. Draga has most deservedly been recognised with an Order of Australia Medal for her service to the Slovenian community, along with a number of other awards and distinctions. Hello and welcome, Draga. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you, Adrian. And I, I think the welcome was a little bit. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate it. <laughs> Your creative output is amazing, and we will cover it in more detail later. But how do you find the time to do all the things you do? Well, when you like doing something, it's no problem finding time. You just you just organize yourself in a different way. And if I want to fill my time with a lot of things, I will just organize it so that I will play the part sometimes at night. And, uh, and the other things, family and the work, it's during the daytime. Mm -hmm. So a lot of night work. Okay. <laughs> If we go back a few years to your childhood, where were you born and raised? I was born in the village Dobrova, close to Ljubljana. We walked to Ljubljana, it's only about 10 kilometers to Ljubljana. And uh, it was a small village and nothing language, it's nothing like Ljubljana language. We are more to do with the accent or to do with the dialect from Rote, which my mother has never in her life said in Slovenian Prishla, I came, but always Prishva, like the Gorenska, mm -hmm. Gorenska accent. And so that's how I grew up, it was that one. Okay. And uh, it's a little village. Uh, that time it uh, had about 150 houses, half of them were farms. Mm -hmm. That's where I grew up. That's lovely. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, how many people were in your family? Well, it was nine children and my mum and dad. Uh, one sister died, she was number three. She died before I actually was born, so I never knew her. But from what I remember, it was eight children and mum and dad. So in the little house mm. that you see on the painting there, which had one bedroom, it was eight children and mum and dad. <laughs> you keep warm. <laughs> Definitely, we had this big, uh, in Slovenia they call it Kmečka page, where they break the bread and uh, even we had one piglet and it was all the food was cooked for the pigs as well mm -hmm. in, the, in the big heater, the big car. And four of us slept on top of that. And there was, in a kitchen, it was a little, um, a little, it was a big table, which you could take the cover off at night and two of my sisters slept in there okay. and the other two sisters slept in the bedroom and my, my brother who was the youngest, he slept uh, in the cot. That's how we fitted eight mm. children in one house. <laughs> <laughs> what type of work did your parents do? My father was a factory worker, he f worked in a tobacco factory. Mm -hmm. But uh, during the war, he was um, he was in a concentration camp in Italy, and then when Italian uh, capitulated, then uh, he was taken by German to a farm and worked on a farm in Austria. All the, the, the war, but my mother didn't didn't go to work at some mm. factory or anything. But she was at home, and we had uh, we hired a small field from one of the farmers, mm -hmm. and so we produced as much as we could at home. And we children, after school every day, we went to help neighboring farmers, either uh, planting potatoes, picking potatoes, doing all the field work, so we could get meals. And we, could, we were paid in uh, food, mm -hmm. so we could have some. And my father worked helping with the harvest and things like that. So that was our chores. Mm. <laughs> chores. What was life like when you were growing up in Slovenia? We 
never knew anything different. We thought that life is like that everywhere. So we didn't miss anything. We were happy. Mm -hmm. We had our toys. We made our toys in a, in a surrounding area, in the bushes with the sticks, and we played the same, Indians or whatever you call it. We had the, the bowls and we, we did all that. And we had a um, hairdressing salon with the grass when in the spring, when the grass was all laid down by mm -hmm. the snow, in the spring along our house and uh, the next doors it was about maybe three, four hundred meters. And along the road there was these bunches of grass mm -hmm. hanging down. And we, that was our hairdressing salon. We made the hair styles mm -hmm. of every bunch of grass all the way up, <laughs> up and down. So that was our toys. We didn't have any, any uh, board tools. We made the girls, we made dolls with the scraps of material, uh, stuff it up and put some more material around and uh, draw eyes on it. And that mm -hmm. was our doll. We didn't have board dolls like days or something. But I guess that's nothing new at that time in Slovenia for anybody anywhere else. I think we were all growing up like that. Mm -hmm. All of us. Who were you influenced by when you were growing up? My parents were a big influence and also the teachers at school and at the college afterwards. But my parents are very, very proud of work they did. And not so much uh, of achievement, but they said, if you do your work well, you've got something to be proud of, no matter what you do. Mm. And I think that stayed with me for the rest of my life. No matter what you do, what your profession is, or what you do, if you do your work well, you've got something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of trust in between us, and that, that's, I think, it's a value that that's stays okay. with me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when and why did you decide to leave Slovenia? Well, my parents died when we were very young, and with my brother, he was younger than me, I was girl number eight in my family, and uh, my sisters, some of them got married, some of them had jobs differently, and we were left on our own. I, I took care of the housework since I was 11, Mm -hmm. because my mom was sick and when she died I was 13 and um, then father was, he got ill and he died and the government has taken his pension away. So my brother and I, we had nothing to live on. I mean, the sisters helped, mm -hmm. but none of them was really rich or anything like that. So when I was at the teacher's college, I was tutoring my uh, relatives uh, three times a week. That's an uh, Slovenian language. Mm -hmm. So my brother and I, we had dinner with them. So that was the payment for the tutoring. And then all the other sisters took us the other day, so we had something to oh. eat. That's lovely. And so when did you actually leave Slovenia? I left in 1967. One of my sisters was having like her work experience or specializations in Germany. Mm -hmm. She was um, a shop assistant and that time over there they said that the German shops, that they give a good, uh, good uh, examples and things and she mm -hmm. was in there. And she was there with her husband and they invited me for a visit. And just in that year I finished the teacher's college. At that time if you were in a communist party, if you were a member of the communist party, you had preference in getting a job. Huh? Well, I didn't become a member of the communist party, so job was impossible to get. Mm -hmm. So I was quite happy when uh, my sister invited me to Germany and I, I worked for a short time, but I had visa visiting visa only, mm -hmm. it was uh, against the law to get a job, especially when I extended the visa. So I was looking for an outlet and mm -hmm. I was hoping for Canada, but it didn't work out mm -hmm. because Canada, waiting list in Canada was after two years. They didn't want to extend my visiting visa for more than a few mm -hmm. months. So Australia was very fast to, yeah. to respond and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. And 
Well, why did you come to Melbourne? Oh, did you first start in Melbourne or where did you first come in Australia? Uh, first was Sydney, but I had a uh, pen friend here. It was actually Anitza Sernet. She was a teacher. She was studying in Germany as well. She was doing her master's degree in Germany. And um, we were corresponding. Mm -hmm. And I had her address when I came here, so they wanted to keep me in Sydney. Mm -hmm. I showed the address and I said, okay. And I remember a Russian lady at Sydney airport, she arranged me to travel oh. to Melbourne. That time I had not came by ship, I mm -hmm. came by plane from uh, London. And to Sydney, and then I came to Essendon Airport, and I remember very well. It will be next Monday. It will be exactly 45 years since I arrived to Melbourne. And uh, at the Essendon Airport, my sister gave me 50 Deutschmarks, which was equivalent to 10 Australian dollars, and that's the all money I had with me when I arrived to Australia. And we, all the migrants, we were given a blue badge so that everybody and the whole plane and everybody mm -hmm. knew you were a migrant. And when I came to Australia, to Melbourne said, oh, I'm here now, I don't need a badge anymore. Apparently somebody from immigration is supposed to meet me and help me to find a train to go oh. from Essendon to Ringwood, where my pink yes. friend lived. Mm -hmm. While well, I took the badge off, they couldn't find me. And I checked my money. And I went outside to the taxi stand and I asked them my limited English, but I was lucky the driver was Hungarian, so he knew German. <laughs> so we spoke German. I said, how much it costs to go to Ringwood? He said, $7. I said, okay, I can go. So he, he drove me to Ringwood. But my pen friend paid for the taxi. So I had $10 for the whole week in Australia. <laughs> But I was lucky, I was very lucky. I spent first night with uh, her family, the second night with her sister family, and the third night I was uh, taken down to Slovenian mission at Kew, where the nuns at that time, the sisters, had a home, and I stayed with them for three days, and then I got uh, my first job in Australia, which was in um, mental institution in Children's College mm -hmm. Kew, Children's Mental Home. And I was put in a hostel there. So, so within one week, I was... Yeah, you did very well very in one well, week. Very quick, very mm. quick, yes. German language helped me a lot, because um, even the, not the matron in the hospital, but the deputy matrons were Latvian and Lithuanian, mm -hmm. and we spoke German. <laughs> Daga, you have a degree from the Teachers College in Ljubljana, and one of your first positions in Melbourne was a teacher at St. James Primary School in Vermont in 1971. How did you go about getting this position, and how did you handle the English language at this time? Well, I loved teaching and even in the mental institution we had uh, special children, special school children and we prepared the little place with them for Christmas and uh, Easter presentation that is, we also, and also we did some extra decoration which the teachers at the special school were most impressed and especially uh, the matron yeah. and we um, we went to um, a camp with the children and where we prepared things and that was, as I said, I was trying to be with children as yeah. much as possible. And then it was this advertisement in um, one of the Catholic newspapers, they are looking for somebody at a new school uh, which would take over uh, a subjects like art and uh, physical education and possibly science. And I thought, I can only apply, they can only say no. Yeah. <laughs> and they interviewed me, it was a um, priest from Mitcham, Father Durkin, and uh, he said, well, I think we can work it out. So I did start, but as I said, the, my language was, was a problem. I was only here for a year and a half, mm -hmm. and I had no English language when I arrived. I mean, I was learning myself in Germany, when you learn yourself, you know you pronounce everything wrong. You can write it, but you cannot pronounce it properly. And that was my big, big uh, draw. 
down for whatever you want to call it. So I uh, I needed to change more afterwards. And I started to work as a, as a tracer with the government. So when you were teaching, what other subjects? You said you initially started with the arts and physics. It was it was art, it was art uh, and science, mm -hmm. science and physical education, and uh, sometimes I got involved with uh, with the music education. Mm -hmm. But that was the great 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 one and great two. So we we rotated uh, with the other with the other two teachers. Mm -hmm. It was a nun and uh, another man. So it was only three of us at the St James School. Because you said it had just started anyway. Yes, so. it just started. You have taught the Slovenian language in Slomšek School, Slovenian Catholic Church in Kew, Slovenian Association Melbourne, Box Hill High School, and Dandenong High School. You've also contributed and written a number of publications about the Slovenian language. Why are you so interested in passing on the knowledge about the Slovenian language? Well, it's the Indian language, it's my passion. I always loved the language and I'm very proud of it. I'm proud that I can speak and I can uh, read the Slovenian literature in the original, especially from the, the big Slovenian writers mm -hmm. and poets, because the Slovenian language is such a beautiful, beautiful language. Uh, if we go back to the teaching in uh, the Slomczyk School, I have started helping out because that time when I worked in, uh, in the hospital, in the mental institution, we had to work Sundays and mm -hmm. the Slomczyk School was offered on Sundays, so there were occasions when I could not, could not come and as I said, it was helping. Mm -hmm. And then, mainly with the Slomczyk School, I started with the youth ones, with the folk dancing group. And that was part of it. And mm -hmm. some of the children of the youth that day, those days they spoke Slovenian quite well because that was the first generation actually being very forceful and very influent that the children had to speak Slovenian. Mm -hmm. and, we them and that was Slovenian. With the Slovenian Association Melbourne, I established the school in 76. We had 40 children. That was Sundays, yes, and uh, then we had to help another teacher came the year after and then a few years later another one, because so it was three of us. Mm -hmm. And with those three teachers we actually prepared some material for children. We had some Slovenian books, some from America, some from Trieste, some from Klagenfurt in Austria, but it was still too hard for the beginning for beginners. So we thought we used the Australian methods because the teacher who came uh, straight after me as well, she's, uh, she was a primary teacher, we got together and we actually produced three-part manual for the... so it was good for Australian children with Australian seasons and mm -hmm. things like that. And it was done, first manual is done bilingual, Slovenian and English, Number two and number three were done just in Slovenian. And we did, we used the Australian methods of teaching. In Slovenia, when they teach the alphabet and the reading, it was just straightforward. Mm -hmm. And it was for children, they knew language. Yeah. Here, they didn't. Mm -hmm. So the approach had to be completely different. And that's what we tried to put. Uh, it's a. Uh, Učimo se Slovensko, ena učimo se Slovensko, dva učimo se Slovensko, tri. Let's learn Slovenian, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And it was well, well received. Oh, and um, the other schools are using it. And we even had some, uh, some schools from Canada to, to send us some copies of the book. And uh, it will be put on our web as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially with the University Library of Ljubljana, it's interesting to put it in the digital library so that it would be uh, more... Uh... You must be very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's good, it's good. Yes, and with the uh, adults, when it comes to adults, which was introduced in the late 90s, adult classes, um, there were two manuals 
produced for them as well. I did those jobs myself. It was um, for the adult people and um, no English in the except in a grammar session because there's one book, it's a workbook and the other one it's explanation, just basic grammar rules. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the one that would go on the web as well on the digital library. Uh, with the high schools, Dog Skill at first and then Dendronong, the Slovenian language became a VCE language in those years. Mm -hmm. That was in ages. And um, we were teaching usually two teachers per school and we had a group I had years seven, eight and nine and it was a lot of work having a mixed class because if you have a mixed class you have to prepare for three classes yeah. or even more because the language knowledge of the Slovenian language it actually forced you to group the children in mm -hmm. more groups than just the class level. And that was hard. And sometimes when it came to exams, you had six, seven levels of exams to prepare and to make sure that the children were according to the proper level because it would not be fair. Somebody who spoke at home Slovenian more would uh, understand it faster than somebody who had no Slovenian language at home. And we also had some Australians coming in. Oh, and that's right. There was um, a wife of a... Uh, a Slovenian lawyer who wanted to learn, she actually did VCE mm -hmm. in Slovenia. She had no Slovenian language before and teaching some, and you had those students in between. So you really, the work was very interesting, very, very <laughs> challenging, <laughs> very challenging when it comes to that. And Box Hill, then we didn't have enough students for two teachers, mm -hmm. so I went to Dendenong. Then again, then the enrollment fell and they closed the Dandenong school and then they closed the box in so it only university school was the longest where it had BC. And now there's nothing. The government closed down the Slovenian language option for the BC. So which is a pity. It lasted for 25, 26 years and now it's nothing. Now I only have a lot. <laughs> you said the Slovenian language is beautiful. Why do you believe it's such a beautiful language? It's tonally, it's the sound of the Slovenian language. It's so, it's beautiful. It's really nice. And uh, then the, the richness of the words, like you try to translate sometimes. And for the Slovenian word, you have to find at least 10 English words, and even then you will not be spot on. Mm -hmm. the Slovenian language is something very amazing. And, well, it's hard to learn. Anybody who's learning it, it's very hard to learn. But I keep saying to all the students, if you learn 10 words a day, or even you learn just 5 words a day, and if you learn to use those words, properly in the sentence mm -hmm. with remembering some of the grammar rules, the Slovenians will think you are very good <laughs> and they will appreciate it, they will appreciate it. And especially when it comes to dual, no other languages have dual form. And I said, look, in Slovenian these days they are skipping the dual a lot. I guess that's influence of English language. But when you use dual, they will say, oh, this person does know something about the language. And to me, it's important as well, not just the language when they learn, that they know something about the culture, about the history. Mm -hmm. To me, that's important, that whoever is learning Slovenian, not just the language. No, it's the complex things. You have to know the culture, you have to know the nation. That's important to me. I think to most of the other Slovenians who are teaching, mm. I think that's important. To know the history and the culture and a little bit of literature. And yeah, how it all goes together. That's right. It's a national pride and it's a pride of uh, history and the whole, the whole culture. I think it, Slovenians deserve that. Mm. What have you said before that you had to create a new system for your students because mm. they're having difficulty learning, but what have they um, had most difficulty understanding when learning the Slovenian language? 
Slovenian language, it's grammar-based language, like most of the Slavic languages and also Latin. And like if I just go more technical, like the Cajuns. There's something that English had the most problem with, because in English you have nothing like that. English grammar, in comparison to Slovenian grammar, English grammar, it's easy. Pronunciation in English language is hard, and the, the number of words you have to choose to pick up the right words, that's hard because the, the vocabulary is so huge. But Slovenian language, grammatically, it's one of the hardest languages. Okay. It's very hard. And, well, we struggle to. <laughs> we try to, you cannot really simplify grammar too much, but the way it's presented, the useful things, and you explain it that way, you explain it in practical, why is it like this, and try to explain that. And like in English, when you have the, the prepositions in English, like of, of that's, that, that's all there is, and you can create any sentence in Slovenian, every preposition, it will change all the endings of the words, and not just one word, the whole link, the whole mm -hmm. sentence. Well, if you don't know the rule, you cannot. You can put a word together, but I it always say not it's, make good, much sense. <laughs> it's good to do one more, one mm. extra step, one extra step, and it does. It does. <laughs> In Slovenia, it is said that every village has its own voice, meaning that there are a number of dialects. Which version of the Slovenian language do you teach? Well, in schools, we are taught to teach the literature, mm -hmm. a literal language. And I always emphasize, I always stress to everybody, said, look, if you speak in a dialect, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's lovely, because people live in a different areas in Slovenia, especially before the so much transport and the radio on TV these days. The language, it's more unified. In the history, it was not. And it developed completely different words, influenced by either Italy or Austria or Hungary or Croatia. But uh, these days, the language in Slovenia, it's uh, changing much faster. The people in Australia, they came from different areas of Slovenia, they kept the dialect. So, and when the children or adults come to the class, they said, look, uh, you are using this word, that's fine. Well, but in a book you will not find this word. In a dictionary you will not find this word. So we will learn another word. And problem solved. <laughs> How do you feel in that most of the second and third generation Slovenian Australians now communicate mostly in English rather than using Slovenian? It is, I think it's with the confidence that they, they feel shy. I can, my own experience with my children, if I am present, they will not like speaking Slovenian. Not that they are good, I must admit, they understand, but uh, speaking Slovenian, they are shy and they think I will, I don't know, criticize or scold yeah. them for it. But when I'm not there, they try. Okay. And I think most of the children, except the ones that had option of studying or visiting Slovenia often, mm -hmm. they have better knowledge and more practice and they speak Slovenia. I think sometimes it's the speed of uh, giving your own opinion with another language, they cannot be so, so good at it, so they prefer English language. Yeah. I find it strange with some people, they know the language well and they completely, they switch to English very quick. But um, sometimes it happens to me too, with some of the girls, they are very good and they think because I teach Slovenia that I will criticize them and they switch to English right away. I said, can you speak Slovenia? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I guess it's like this. And I, I was like that when I came to Australia as well when I was learning English, in front of my friend who was a, a French and English teacher, a French and German and English teacher, I would not speak English in front of her. <laughs> I would not. 
<laughs> I guess we all listen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, let's hope that they will get more courage and more confidence in uh, we're trying to do this. Okay. So okay. And practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. And as I said, if these days we travel to Slovenia, it helps them a lot mm. to to come in contact with the life language, with everybody around them in the language, and they just said, just try. Nobody will laugh, nobody will do anything bad to you. They might correct you, some might, some might put a smile on it, but it's in appreciation that you're trying. Think, think positive, not, not uh, criticize or they're laughing at me. No, they're not laughing at you. And do you think that Slovenianness in Australia can survive without the younger generation speaking Slovenian? That's a very hard question. Um, Slovenians in Australia, it will be hard to survive without the younger generation speaking Slovenian. We do have influx of new people which will uh, hopefully uh, mingle and help the younger one to make that step mm -hmm. and converse more in Slovenian language. But to me, it's very important that Slovenians, the younger Slovenians, even they don't know the language perfect, that they do know where their parents and grandparents come from, they do know about culture, they do know about literature, and they do know about the most important things about the Slovenian uh, as a nation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, with some cases, the people, some people are gifted with the languages. The others are not. And the ones they are not gifted, I think it's a positive step if they know, if they learn about the Slovenia and they know about Slovenia, as well as trying to learn. But uh, it will be a very hard thing to, to, uh, to keep Slovenian culture and Slovenian national pride in Australia if there is no language, no language left. Mm -hmm. Dragia, you have contributed to the Lonely Planet Mediterranean European Facebook, the Slovenian section. How did you choose which phrases to include and the spelling of the Slovenian word in English? The Lonely Planet uh, publication group, they actually uh, sent you the instructions and they sent you the options of the words to use and because it's a phrase book, they go for uh, mainly for, uh, to do with, uh, with the food, with the directions, and with the emergencies and we had a sort of a set, set uh, sentences and said um, expressions, what they would like to translate. Slovenian being a smaller group and not many people traveling to Slovenia at that time, the, the space was limited in the booklet. The other languages had much more. Mm -hmm. And the Slovenian, it was said it was um, directive, that was a directive what to do. And uh, I just picked up the ones that I thought were most useful and what's uh, important to know. Mm -hmm. And with the um, the language had to be presented as well a phonetic. So the English mm. alphabet used for Slovenian words, which was most interesting. I've never done that before. <laughs> and it was most interesting using English characters to pronounce properly Slovenian words. It was a good exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, did they give you much feedback about? No, actually there wasn't no, no I oh. don't remember any feedback, no. That's not helpful. No, it all depends. Lonely Planet usually don't tell you how many books they've sold and how many people mm. they traveled. But it would be actually interesting to follow how many. From what I know, there was an update done mm. and somebody in America, I think, have done the second edition of, okay. of the Slovenian. I think it's more, it's uh, including much more than that one was. Oh, good. It's something is done, that's mm. important. That's important, that's true. Between 1980 and 1990, you were a Slovenian language translator for the Australian Immigration Department. What type of translation work did you do there? 
For immigration, there was mainly documentation, sometimes certificates, school, uh, school certificates, uh, merit certificates, the baptismals or mm -hmm. something like that, but also some uh, personal letters uh, when it was to do with inheritance and there were means legal papers, the hardest language to translate. Mm -hmm. And um, also, in some cases, the, the people they were sending a letter to ombudsman, which was to do with the personal personal matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a variation of things. Yes, yes, it was very interesting. Now, and sometimes the legal the legal is always the hardest one to translate. Mm -hmm. From 2009 to 2011, you produced three major books. Anthology of Slovenian Artists and Sculptors in Australia, Chronicles of Slovenian Schools and Slovenian Language Teachers in Australia, and Dreams to Reality. How did the ideas for the books come about? How much work is involved in producing these books? How did you source the materials for these projects? And were there any other people involved in these projects? And if we go back to the anthology of Slovenian artists, it was two involved. There was another teacher, also an artist. And um, we just thought, look, people in, Slova in Australia, there's quite a few artists that we knew about it, and then we just uh, sent uh, information out, some by email, some by mail, and the radio and uh, some personal contact or they knew somebody who's also an artist and uh, we just let's compile it, let's do it. I got the uh, information on the art, on the artists themselves and we decided to do it in both languages. Mm -hmm. So we were very lucky. There was an um, art critic from Slovenia who actually made the statements about each person's art. Okay. She has received that and she wrote about it, which is like a, what's a proper word? It's not really critics, but it's, um, she's art historian mm -hmm. and she has a very valuable descriptions of early artists and their work. Um, I think that adds the value to the, to the book. Um, we had uh, nearly 80, 80 artists, some from Adelaide, some from Darwin, so Sydney, Melbourne, mm -hmm. surrounding areas, and which is good, which is very good. And um, then the second one was the uh, Chronicle of Slovenian Teachers and Slovenian Schools and Slovenian mm -hmm. Teachers in Australia. And then again, I always think I'm afraid that with elderly people dying and the younger generation not being in touch with the community anymore, the things will be lost. And that's the main reason why why I'm so actually saying pushy <laughs> that I think it's important that the information is collected in some sort of form that it's available to further to generations of the future, and also for somebody else. That's what I usually um, do if it's either both languages or English. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important no, to also to Australia here that the Australian community realizes that Slovenians are not just factory workers, mm -hmm. that there is, they are exceeding, they are excelling in certain professions, in certain arts or something. That's very important to me. I'm proud of Slovenians, and I want them to, somebody else to be proud of too. And uh, then it's also another book that I did that wasn't uh, mentioned there. It was um, Golden Harvest and Beyond. It's a chronicle of Slovenian Association Melbourne. That was done. Then. See, these books, they don't, I didn't research and produce the book in one year, the way it was published. Yeah. <laughs> it takes, like the art one, it took two three years before we could actually come to the stage and we applied for a grant, because in a grant you have to complete it in one year. But okay. before that we had quite a lot of preparations done. The same with the Chronicle of, uh, 
of the Slovenia Association of Melbourne, Golden Harvest. I was working for that for when the Slovenia Association had a 50th anniversary. But then it fell through, they didn't go through with the publication, said, look, all this work, I think it's done, we put it finally together and we produced the book. So mm -hmm. that was done on um, two years ago. And then the, the From Dreams to Reality, that came actually from the Consul General in Sydney. He said, look, uh, it's 20th anniversary of Slovenian independence, what about it? I said, look, it's a lot of material to prepare, a lot of research, and he said, look, we will help, we will see what we can do. The, luckily, that material was in the archives of the Slovenian National Councils, which were in all states, okay. and so some of the material was there, and of course some publications, and some photographic material, which a different person had. So it was, I could say, every night job. <laughs> every night job. And I also went to Sydney to, to pick up some material because Sydney had a lot more uh, with, to do with National Council because the Consul General was there and he was having a lot of information. He was having all the contacts with the visiting parliamentarians from Slovenia the first when they arrived. So he had more photographic material and all that. And uh, yes, but it was, um, what do you call it, a full speed ahead <laughs> for the whole project. Very big jobs. <laughs> Very big jobs, yeah, because I did all the, the scanning and I did mm. the, the typing. I'm not a typist, so I typed with four fingers, so that slowed me down. And um, then, of course, the design, the layout and the design of the book and so on. That took ages too. If we look at your involvement with the Slovenian community, you have been the coordinator of cultural programs and performances, and director and producer of the Slovenian Amateur Drama Group. Does the involvement come as a natural progression from your position as a language teacher, or did you have to learn, or did you learn new skills in directing drama, for example? Well, the culture programs were always my record. I enjoy doing them. Mm -hmm. I, I am lucky that I usually get idea and I try to realize that idea how I'm very much for symbolism. Whenever programs I was coordinating, I used a different symbolic idea for a, for a presentation, how the program will be presented. I usually had the programs with the um, a story. So, like, if I give you example of the 35th anniversary of the Slovenian Association album, we named it, we titled it, Goodbye Slovenia, uh, Good Day Australia. Mm -hmm. And we had the map of Slovenia with the major regions, and every region had a combination of marked, which was on the back, it was a long ribbon. And when the, when the new region, when we were saying goodbye for it to each region of Slovenia, on the stage we had a performance for that particular, typical, for, for that particular region. Mm -hmm. Like we started with Koroška, we had a choir singing a Koroška song, and then of course the, the, the cradle and the woman in a national costume, with the Koroška national costumes. Mm -hmm. And when the, the during the narrating, the carnation was picked up from the map of Koroška and brought across like it's being pulled out of the ground and taken to Australia, to, to that one. And we did that for every region. And every region was represented either with a comedy sketch, with the folk dancing, with the songs, with the literature or something like that. that was, and then we came, we switched to Australia and then it was the... the modern dancing or symbolic dancing with the youth, with the, we had a Ned Kelly and all those mm -hmm. things, what the migrants coming here had to accept. And sort of that was one of the problems, how I like to present uh, the problems usually. It's a, it's a story to everyone, it's not just uh, this item now, next one, so and so, no, I like to do it in the story. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
as I said, with the gold, with the golden anniversary, we had uh, done in years of ten years groups, and we did a young girl giving out wheat, a bunch of wheat, everything, and uh, then they were bringing. At first, they were bringing it to her every ten years. So much gold, so much harvest was collected culturally, historic and everything, mm -hmm. and give it to the girl who was representing the thread for all those years. And again, with the program, and at the end, the girl, um, she, was, she did a symbolic dance, and she presented the big bunch of wheat as a symbolic a harvest to the first, second generation president who was then, mm -hmm. so like now, the first generation gives you yeah. the, that one. So the, that's that's how I like to present mm -hmm. the, the programs. And that's I mean every doesn't it can be a smaller culture program, but I will still try to use symbolics. I just love symbolics. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually try to use some classical either but I, I don't know something like that. Mm -hmm. We did for uh, HQ, which was um thirtieth is it thirty fifth anniversary of the church. We used actually Schubert's um the concerto for the flame. The, the title we used the, the lets the flame of the faith grow even taller. Something like that it was the title. And uh, the girl was actually presenting the flame and with that one, with the flame, all the items were actually building up on the flame. So I, I just love symbolics. <laughs> it's a good way to do it. Yeah, and with drama group, I am, what do you call it? I love stage. I love all live performances, and we did some at school, at the teacher's college, and uh, I was, whenever, even with the children, we did a lot of little plays, and with the children, you don't have to. They, they are so natural, you mm. just put them, this is what I would like, and they usually do it. They, usually, oh, they ask, oh, like this, like this, yes, of course, like <laughs> this. <laughs> and that's how it is. With the adults, we started uh, more comedies, mainly comedies we did. And uh, because people said we've got so much sadness in our lives, we want to laugh when you come and watch. So we do, uh, we did quite a few. And uh, all the comedies are in Slovenians. Mm -hmm. We had some uh, easier material, not sophisticated comedies, which people say they are not, not really good for Australian migrants. It's okay for Slovenia, but not here, because oh, they okay. said that, that they wouldn't possibly they would not even understand what's really funny about it. Um, yes, uh, so we have to go for simple ones. And there are times when we have to adjust. We have a group and they are enthusiastic. And if we pick up the comedy, there it's not so many parts. It's very hard to say to somebody, I don't have a part for you this year. Yeah. So what we do, we adjust it, we write in another part or two. Mm -hmm. For the comedy three years ago, we wrote in five parts. We added five parts just so that we could include the whole group, that mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't be left out. Yeah. <laughs> Are these all in Slovenian language? Yes, all in Slovenian. Where have you performed these productions? We were practicing at the Slovenian religious centers in Kew, and so the premiere was always there, and we usually we do one or two uh, repeats to mm -hmm. other performances. But we played, uh, we performed also at the other clubs, Slovenian clubs in Melbourne, and um, with Geelong we did it at the light. Trying to think which play we did with Adelaide. I think it was the Chalana Anchka, I think. And uh, also in Sydney, in Sydney in the Culture Centre. Okay. So we, we do travel quite a bit mm. and uh, we are quite lucky. The people like the comedies yeah. that we put up. <laughs> so that's important. Draga, you have received an impressive amount of awards and distinctions, such as the Order of Australia Medal. Republic of Slovenia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cultural Medal, Victorian Premier's Literature Award for Science for Design work with Vickers Rich, Editor's Choice Award for Poetry, She Books Arts Award, etc. 
What do these awards mean to you? Well, I've got them. I'm no different for it. I'm still the same person. I, I enjoy working. And I really, whatever work I do, as I said, I enjoy it and I try to put my best in. And um, that's, that's just who I am. And mm. I'm not, I don't think so that any awards would make any, if I would got it or not, it would make any difference. I just enjoyed the, the, whatever I was doing. And um, Do you get a sense of pride that your work's been acknowledged in this way? Yes, it is, is a sense, yes, of course it's a sense mm. of pride. And it's sort of that people actually thought it's worthy of the, the an award and... I think it's, yes, it's, uh, it's a pride and happiness, mm. but uh, also I'm still a Slovenian, and whenever a Slovenian receives an award, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Your current project is the Historical Archives of Slovenians in Australia, HASA, Slovenian website. Can you please tell me about this project? The website was um, in, what could I say? It's uh, something that it's uh, accessible by many, many people, much more than the books, especially when it's so freely offered. And I thought that websites, especially for the younger generations, it's the in thing these days. Uh, if it's not on the web, they won't look at it. And I thought with all the richness that the Slovenian community in Australia is holding in their archives, the photographic, or in their own as a personal stories, it's important that that's given to the younger generation and to the other, not just the Slovenian community, and to the other communities in a form they enjoy. And I guess maybe that's teacher in me again, but I always like to think Give them as much as you can. Give them more than you possibly can, so they might pick up some mm -hmm. and keep it. So if we give a lot in the Hasa archives, if we give them the, the richness of the culture, the, the migrant stories, the activities of Slovenians while they as migrants, when they come in, when they grouped, the community, growth of the community, establishment of the homes in every state of Australia, there is, except in Darwin, there is a Slovenian home in every state, more than one home. And the church, the, the religious centers, and I think that's important. Like second and third generations, the ones they don't belong to any community or to any club, they will still find it on the web. And they will say, oh, there is. And sort of that's the main thing, why it's so important why it is important, especially in a form that's close to them. And the web page is the one to go. The same then with the, with the film or the interviews, YouTube. That's, that's the in thing with the young people. Unless you go along with them, you are pushed away. Mm -hmm. We have to go with the time. Which Slovenian associations and religious centre does this include? Well, it's in the progress. It's not completely done yet. So far, we have Slovenia Association London, which the oldest, the oldest uh, club, and um, there is promises for Adelaide. That's uh, working to three people actually included, <laughs> uh, working for the Slovenia Association Adelaide. Perth is already completed. The Western Australia, Brisbane, it's uh, the Queensland. It's in uh, progress. And Sydney, it's, um, I've got some for one of the clubs, some, uh, some material. And Canberra, I've got agreement. And uh, Geelong, uh, I've got promise. And there's another club in, in Victoria that just uh, let me know this morning. They've got material ready, so I will be getting it. So which is another big club. But with the religious centre, because they have their web page uh, based in Sydney, they will, they sort of said, express the wish that they would stay with that web page, even when I said, look, 
the web page that you have, it's in Slovenian language, and for second and third generation, they don't get all the richness what the church has contributed to the community, but it's their decision. I'm, I'm hoping that we can give the information, just a short information of the Slovenian religious centers in Australia on the Hasso web page, and with the links to the other one. Whoever can manage mm. the Slovenian language will have to struggle with that one, but the other, it's in Slovenian, and that's a little bit hard. I was a little bit surprised when they, when they uh, said that they will keep the Slovenian, they will not, uh, not contribute to mm. the English one, so it's a pity, but nothing I can do. Yeah. <laughs> you said the website is in English, is there some Slovenian as well? Some material, when it's document uh, scanned, uh, it is uh, Slovenian, but uh, mainly it's in English. It is um, aimed at the second or third, third generation and also for general public in mm -hmm. uh, Australia or wherever uh, English-speaking world. Even Slovenians uh, in Slovenia, they speak a lot of English so they can pick it up and, uh, and understand. Mm -hmm. and so that we are hoping for Australian audience and American audience, English-speaking audience. Yeah. Are you working on any other projects at the moment? And can you tell us something about them? Right now, we are working on an um, exhibition of uh, Slovenian artists and also including children. The title of the exhibition is Colors of Love and it will be staged next month in the Slovenian Association of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So far we have 107 works of art for the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are having uh, guest artists from the Slovak community, and she will also be a judge for the children's art. And she will select one artist or one piece of art that will make the most, the best impression on her. She's not judged as a critic, mm -hmm. but just the best impression, and that will receive, they will receive an award as a certificate, no monetary awards. With the children, we have them from year six, uh, eight, six to 12, and the children will be judged by her, and there will be two prizes for every age, and it will be how they presented the topic, Colors of Love and Technique. Mm -hmm. Children will be given book awards. Okay. So that from 6 to 12, but the rest is adults. And, well, we thought we will give encouragement awards because there is some third generation artists included in the exhibition already. So I thought it would be nice if they receive encouragement awards. And among children, we have a lovely young boy he attends a special school, and I suggest that we give him a um, special achievement award. Mm -hmm. Because uh, being in special school, it's a, a big achievement actually that he is participating yeah. and that the painting is quite good. <laughs> yeah. How did you get an idea to start these new projects? Well, ideas come. <laughs> Sometimes it can be half asleep, sometimes you can do something, or even being on a train, I travel to work to the city on a train, and sometimes you read a book, sometimes you just think and kick the idea mm -hmm. comes and you write it down, one, two, three words, throw the mind next time, oh, that was that. That's it. <laughs> sometimes a song, songs are usually, the lyrics of the songs are usually very good ideas for the culture programs, or for the bigger project. Mm -hmm. So I'm just they come. <laughs> I just have to be grateful. They come. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you aim to achieve when taking on a new project? Well, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist sometimes, and I get disappointed if the things are not going the way I would like. But um, I like people to appreciate whoever is involved in the project, if that's a culture program, the performers, if it's art in the artist, if it's a historical thing in the preservation, that's, that's my aim. Whichever project, it's got its own aim. And that's how I think, 
and um, as I said, I like to do the best I can. I, I guess that's teaching me, I need to give. Yeah. <laughs> I need to give. Sadaga, how is important is making a project at a very high quality level from content to publishing? As you're saying, you are a perfectionist. So. Well, it's always, I think we are all um, visual people. If something looks good, if something is uh, attractive, we will pick it up. We will look at it and we will follow it. And, well, that's the whole thing when it comes to presentation. There is no special rule, but to make it attractive, to make it pleasing to the eye, to make it, to make somebody happy, whichever way it is, that's, the, that's, that's thank you enough. <laughs> and I think that's the mind, that's how, that's how it is. And uh, to, to do the work well, whichever, I don't know, in uh, culture programs or in the books or whatever, if you do your work, it's, you feel good about it. And, I think that's important. Your own sense of fire. <laughs> you have, for a number of years, worked as a graphic artist at Monash University in Melbourne, School of Geoscience. What has working in that environment taught you about visual presentation? As I said, visual presentation is important. Working with the lectures, um, preparing some of the lectures, either PowerPoints or just other visual the posters and that, and it's important. The message needs to be clear. And that goes for anything you do. Is it culture problem? Is it book? The message needs to be clear. Mm -hmm. If the message is not clear, you, you mess that up. And uh, with the working with lectures, it actually trained me in determination. And whatever you start, you keep going. And you keep going until you are satisfied. Sometimes you are not even at the end. You are not satisfied, but the time limit stops you, mm. and that happens with the deadlines a lot. That you just have to stop at a particular point. But uh, the lecturers are very good with that. They've got a very good time management skills, and I guess I've learned that from them. They, I had a lot of uh, advice with the time management, especially meeting uh, deadlines on uh, huge projects. Mm -hmm. And unless you stick to the timeline, unless you stick to the plan, it's nearly impossible to complete the project, especially if it's got to be done at a particular date. Mm -hmm. And we prefer, we did a lot of big exhibitions, and like there was one Godwana that traveled all over the world for five, six years. Mm -hmm. And to meet that, we had to start, the building was built while we already had to design the exhibition and it was the whole group. We worked for weekends, voluntary work for weekends to come to the opening date and everything was finished and everything was done. But it was a lot of weekends, a lot of night works. We worked sometimes 14, 15 hours a day to, to complete. I'm not saying that's healthy, but at that particular exhibition it was important because uh, it was a worldwide, mm. worldwide presentation, and then it traveled to so many places. But so the lectures, working along with them, I have learned a lot, and I am very grateful for that. Taking all projects requires capital investment. Do you receive funding grants from Slovenia or Australia to assist you? With the books, I had some uh, grants from Slovenia, which uh, didn't cover the printing or anything. So most of the books that it, it was done with the pre-orders, otherwise there was no way, oh, okay. mm -hmm. no way we could actually publish any any of them. All was done with pre-orders. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why sometimes you have to extend the, the time a little bit, or hoping that people will, mm -hmm. you cannot, I mean, I cannot finance a book, mm -hmm. and not many people can. And the church wouldn't, or any other organization, they cannot function, they are not in position to, to fund uh, projects like that. Mm -hmm. So we did pre-orders every time. As you are in possession of a very active mind, what ideas do you have bubbling away for your next project? Oh, it's a few, but they are not crystallized yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see what it comes up. 
sometimes you have to put them on the back burner a little bit, and then it will pop up and say, oh, this I can do. So there's a few things that would be nice, but nothing I could really say about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> what drives you to take on all of these projects? Well, I guess I just love Slovenian people, and I love Slovenian culture, and I think I'm proud of being Slovenian, and I'm proud of being Australian, and I would, I just need to do things like that. I just, as I said, I guess maybe that's part of the teacher in me, or whatever. I just think whatever, whatever ideas come to me, I like to share. And I like to share things, and I can do, I can suggest certain things, and I just like to be part of the circle who keeps doing things. Yeah. I, I think it's for the good of people. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Zadaka Kirk, congratulations on your outstanding career thus far. Thank you so much for doing this interview, and we look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs>